entangled and plummeting to earth, how they survived the fall. In the southeast, they infiltrated a vicious gang and got shot. Compensation for the undercover cops forced out of their jobs. The latest embarrassment, Hackney investigates its own anti-corruption unit. Good evening. The moment has finally come. After 30 days of campaigning, the people are today delivering their verdict on the next inhabitant of number 10. Polling stations will be open until 10 o'clock tonight, and so far the weather's been good. After clocking up hundreds of miles the length and breadth of the nation to woo the voters, there was little left for the party leaders to do today but cast their own votes. More from our political correspondent, Sean Lay. For all the party leaders, the day of the general election is a great leveller. This morning, Tony Blair was just one of the voters in his Sedgefield constituency. They're still not quite old enough to vote, but three of Mr Blair's children joined him and his wife on their trip to the polling station. William Hay cast his ballot just across the county boundary in his constituency of Richmond. Side by side with his wife, Fionn, Mr Haig had two ballot papers because of the council elections, which are also taking place okay. today. Right, now we'll do the other one. Charles Kennedy visited a polling station in his Highlands constituency, but he wasn't there to vote. And you're not talking fashion. <laughs> He's joined a growing trend, those taking part in the election by post. The rule for postal voting have been relaxed for the first time at this general election. In some areas, as many as one in three people are choosing that option rather than turning up in person at a polling station. Election officials are trying to make voting as attractive as possible. In this fish and chip shop in South Bristol, you cast your ballot next to the batter and get a reward for your trouble. <laughs> Two of the party leaders won't be waiting nervously for their own result this time. Yean Wynne Jones of Plaid Cymru isn't seeking re-election as an MP, nor is the SNP leader John Swinney, but they both still turned out to vote. For those who haven't yet, there's a sharp word from 98-year-old Doris Can from Birchington in Kent. She's made the effort at every election since 1929. How will the country run if nobody votes for somebody? They've got to run the country, haven't they? And they've got to have votes. And if people don't go, what's happening? There's no excuse if you live on an island either. Ballot boxes were delivered to Rathlin off the coast of County Antrim this morning. The constituencies in Northern Ireland are the last to declare. So the final outcome of the 2001 general election won't be settled until tomorrow afternoon. Sean Lay, BBC News. At the Old Bailey, Lord Archer's former St Robert Hall is there. Robert. Well, it's pretty quiet in this corner of Sunderland City Centre at the moment, but it's all going to be very different later on. Because seconds after the polling stations here closed for business, 50 vehicles and 40 runners will be making that dash for the record books. Now, they aim to have counting underway within five minutes, the first trickle, of you, if you like, of a flood of votes right across the country. Now, our team, both here in Sunderland and others across the UK, will be following every moment of the action, as I discovered earlier when I visited the election studio. Now, the key thing for every member of that team is to ensure that the results get here to the studio as fast and as accurately as possible, and then to give you a rapid analysis of what it means for the whole country. Seconds after each result drops into this massive computer system, you can see it either on BBC News or on your own computer, or on the new interactive service that's available for those of you with digital TV. But let's move on across the studio, because the headline news and the figures travel on to another bank of computers. The experts behind these screens are here to penetrate that fog of statistics to give you an idea of why people voted in the way they did, to compare the figures with the last general election, and perhaps to give you, as the night goes on, an idea of what it all means for the different political parties. It may all still be something of a blur, but you won't drop off because there's a familiar face to ensure that you don't. Here he is, the real Peter Snow, surrounded, as you can see, by virtual reality. Peter, what have you got for us this election? Robert, I think I can guarantee you that we'll give people the most exciting election night ever. Here, for example, is William Hague and the Tory party's staircase to power, because he and his party have to turn all these seats of his opponents blue if they have to win an overall majority. Of course, it could be Labour that are turning blue seats red if they're making gains. And we have the most innovative swingometer in history. 
This is a laser sphingometer. Look at the laser beam zapping these red seats blue. If it goes that way, if the swing goes this way to labor, it'll be zapping these blue seats red, and so on. It's going to be a very exciting night. Now, all of those elements, the results from 140 constituencies, the live updates from 200 outside broadcasts, the shocks, the surprises, everything ends up at the desk of the man who's in the election hot seat for the sixth time. Uh, David Dimbleby faces an unrelenting tide of information. Now, his job is to miss nothing and to keep you with him for eight continuous hours. Well, here in Sunderland, we've been intrigued by the council's plan, a plan which I'm told includes reinforcements from the business community, people with nimble fingers used to counting money who might just give the council that age. Now, hopefully, we'll be back with you between half ten and quarter to eleven when these squares will be covered by empty ballot boxes and we'll be on the point of hearing whether Sunderland have indeed broken their record. Fiona. Thanks very much, Robert. And you can join me, David Dimbleby, Peter Snow and Jeremy Paxman for Vote 2001 from 5 to 10 tonight here on BBC One. Now, has the weather been good to voters? Michael Fisher's here to tell us. Thank you very much, Fiona. I shouldn't actually think there were very many votes for the weather today. We've had heavy showers and thunderstorms, even some mini tornadoes. Of course, that doesn't apply to the whole country. There were some areas that escaped. Tomorrow, it's again a mixture of sunshine and showers, and it remains fairly unsettled into the weekend as well. But there is a glimmer of hope for next week, but more about that near the top of the hour. A good scattering of showers across us at the moment. Many of them in eastern areas are still quite heavy. They're beginning to fade, though, from the west at the moment. And I think as far as central and eastern parts are concerned for the rest of the night, it should be fine and dry with clear skies. But showers are going to keep going in the north and in the west, particularly so in the northeastern corner of Scotland and the northern Isles. But with those clearing skies, it is going to end up a jolly cold night. You wouldn't think it's early June, would you? Three, four, five degrees or so, even a touch of frost in one or two of those northern spots spots. Tomorrow, central and eastern areas start off dry, bright and sunny. Showers right from the word go in the west and in the north, and it isn't going to take much for that cloud to bubble up again, just as it did today, and for showers to break out. One or two quite heavy ones as well. They will tend to fade away again in the latter part of the day, the sunshine coming back, but in northwestern areas, actually, by that time, they'll be ganging together to give some longer outbreaks of rain. Again, on the cool side in many parts, the best temperature is about 15, 16, 17 degrees or so. And then, as I said, the unsettled weather continues really for the foreseeable future, certainly in...